Hello everyone, Dr. Christine Smith back for a great interview today about autoimmune and understanding the fatigue that can come with it, which is more than just feeling tired. And it's really understanding what's happening to our cells working for all of this, and then also understanding restrictive diets and how they can be beneficial, but also how they need to be done right for the case and depending on what's going on and where your body is at. So I wanted to bring on my friend, Dr. Al, um, Dr. Allison Danby, mm -hmm. who is a specialist in autoimmune. So thank you so much for joining me this morning. How are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm excited to be on here with you, Dr. Christine. Yeah, absolutely. I know you and I have had many talks over the years, just kind of about little things that we really agree on about autoimmune, but I'd love to kind of dive into your understanding of it, because I know you've done so much work with it and had so much success with really tough cases with clients. And so in all this, like, why don't we just start with like, telling us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in this niche of autoimmune and formed this passion with it. Awesome, yeah, I'd love to. It was, it's actually, I kind of stumbled on it in a way, but. So I'm a naturopathic doctor, a functional medicine practitioner for 17 years now. And I actually went through my own autoimmune journey, but that wasn't what got me into autoimmune. I was working with a lot of patients on pain and uh, pain management. And I kept having patients coming in uh, that were diagnosed with autoimmune. And their doctor was like, you just have to do this. There's nothing else. Diet doesn't play into it. There's no other reasons. Like there's nothing else that will help. You just have to take the medication and we're going to hope that it controls it. And if not, we'll just add more medications on. And because I had gone through my own autoimmune journey and went through all the frustrations and the ups and downs, I knew that wasn't true. I absolutely knew that it wasn't true. There was so much more that we could do. So I started working with these patients and I just kept hearing the same story over and over again. And that's when I'm like, all right, enough's enough. Like medication is important, um, but it's not the only solution. And it's not the only thing that we need to be doing. Because what we find in a lot of the research is that when you add all the other lifestyle stuff, you actually see a change in progression as opposed to a decline. And it doesn't have to be overcomplicated things, which is really exciting. So there is a lot more that we can do in conjunction with the medication, if that's what is required, but there's just so much more. It's just, it's exciting. It's really exciting. Absolutely. And there's, I like how you mentioned, like there's just, there's so many little things that you can do in your daily life that don't cost anything. Cause yeah. I think that's like one of the other things that is, misconstrued all the time is people are like functional medicine is expensive, which like, yes, it is. If you're diving into like all the lab analyses and medications and things, but a lot of the time, a lot of what's being taught is just lifestyle medicine. Like that is a really huge foundation of functional medicine. So if you can learn the lifestyle and biohacking pieces, you already know half the stuff that we want you to know. And then we just get to build on top of it. So yeah. I know you've taught like a variety of series around this for exactly that purpose, right? Creating that educational foundation for people, no matter where they are in their journey, so that they always have a place to start. And then if they decide that they want to continue in care, then they can dive deeper. But you have did a whole series around how the fatigue and autoimmune is different than normal fatigue. And I think this is a really good point because we just often think of fatigue as like our energy to do stuff, but also there's all that sub-level energy that our body needs to do stuff. So I'd love to hear your take on kind of the other fatigue as you called it. Yeah. So I, I actually uh, created a whole, um, I started teaching to over 2,500 different doctors in North America on autoimmune fatigue because it's one of the ones that is the number one gaslit symptom because medication doesn't address it. So even though we start to see changes and depending on the autoimmune condition, we may see changes that correlate with the medication, the inflammation coming down, but some of the conditions we don't. So it is quite different. Um, now, before we dive into why it's different, we still wanna rule out the things that are similar. So we wanna make sure iron and B12 are optimal, vitamin D is optimal, that you're sleeping because bottom line, if you're not sleeping, you are going to have fatigue. You're not healing, especially with autoimmune. Um, that is when recovery happens. So it's, it's one of the number one barriers. So we want to make sure that we're ruling out all the things that can cause fatigue in every single person, thyroid numbers as well, um, absorption of nutrients. So those are really important. But when we start to look at why autoimmune fatigue is quite different, there's, there's about four different uh, reasons. One is, and you and I have talked about this, is the mitochondria, so the cellular function. So we know that with most chronic conditions, autoimmune being one of them, 
that the mitochondria, which is the energy production of every single cell in your body, except your red blood cells, every single cell requires the mitochondria to function and produce energy. Now, medications can block that, but also too, when you have your body with autoimmune, your mitochondria is now turning into, instead of an energy production, it's turning into an alarm bell and signaling danger, danger, danger to all the different cells in the body saying there's a problem, there's a problem. So it's not doing its job properly. So we do need to address that. And that's where that whole root cause kind of comes in is looking at, well, why is it doing that? And sometimes we can find it if it's still early on, possibly if we, if we see some viral issues, sometimes it's now adaptive where the body just can't shut it off. So the, it, the virus may not be causing that danger response, but the inflammation is just so high and now the body's adapted and we have to take kind of a different approach. So there's a lot of variables that play into that. The other factors are inflammation, which I think is obvious for a lot of people. We know inflammation goes really high with autoimmune, but then we also have oxidative stress, which is essentially aging. So it's, we see that rusting in the real world. We see it when avocados and apples turn brown. We see it on ourselves when we're aging with wrinkles and <clears throat> excuse me, aged spots. That's happening inside as well. And that itself actually changes the inflammation pattern. So it increases inflammation even more. So we see this whole cascade of that. And like we can talk about things that actually help with those. And some of the, actually I'll, I'll mention this one. There was a study that was done on uh, rheumatoid arthritis for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And they found that just eating blueberries every day reduced the oxidative stress and they saw improvements in symptoms. So something as simple as that, like a, they're just so high in antioxidants. So we know that autoimmune is an oxidation um, and that's where the antioxidants come into play. And then kind of the last one that we're starting to really come out, and I noticed that there's uh, quite a few more doctors that are talking about this, but when we look at the research on trauma as a childhood trauma, so the whole thing, the body keeps score, the body says no, all these different areas, it changes how we respond to stress. So what we're finding is that if you've had childhood trauma, you are at a higher affinity of developing autoimmune, developing more complications from autoimmune because your stress response has changed. So you may not have high cortisol at this point. Cortisol is what shuts off inflammation. So a lot of these people, their cortisol is really low. They're not getting a big stress response, but their nervous system is going up super high. So you're not sleeping, but you can't, you don't have that inflammation or that cortisol to shut it off. So it's a really big imbalance. And we're seeing that as one of the big underlying players. And then the gut is influenced by a lot of those other things. It's not like it, when we look at kind of what's coming before the leaky gut, which everyone's like, oh, it's leaky gut, so we've got to fix that. We're looking at all these other things that are creating that leaky gut experience. Um, so well before. That's why it's such a hard one to diagnose. Like on average, it's four years. It used to be seven. Now the research is saying four years. Wow. So that's, that's a lot. Yeah. So she, she just went over so many important things. I just wanted to like yeah. re-encapsulate them a little bit for you guys. One of the things that you just mentioned that I think is really important is you mentioned how if you're stressed out and you lack cortisol because you've been using it for your own mental stress, you no longer have the thing that allows you to calm your inflammation. So there's an association between an overactive immune system and being stressed out because your body's resources are using that for stress instead of calming the immune system. And just like she mentioned, there's people like Gaber Mate, who's known as like the father of understanding trauma. And he's written books like When the Body Says No, which is a whole book about personality types and the different autoimmune conditions that they can sometimes end up with. And it's pretty fascinating research that's out there in the field. So it's not new information. And then the oxidative stress thing that you mentioned. So like we are still coming to understand autoimmune. It's a very confusing thing in the body. We do not have a full understanding of how the immune system works. We're always learning new stuff and always finding new things. The body is one of the most complex things in the universe. So when we start thinking about autoimmune, there's like a couple different theories around it. The best that we understand it is basically something called molecular mimicry, yep. where the body accidentally thinks that self tissue looks like an enemy and it goes and attacks that thing. And then there's the other idea where it's when we deal with a lot of stress or we deal with a lot of toxic exposure or we deal with infections or chemicals in the body, things like that, or mental stress, it creates oxidative stress, which is basically, you know, gly like glycation. It's like rust on a car. It's like accumulation of sugar molecules that makes things not function as well. And then our immune system goes and tries to clean that up. And then it ends up 
interacting with the oxidation and self tissue at the same time and still gets confused. So that's like a similar but slightly different mechanism that's also being researched, but we're still, again, coming to understand all of this. And then, you know, she also mentioned leaky gut, which it's kind of like a chicken or the egg game, but most of the time you won't find an autoimmune case that is not dealing with some kind of leaky gut. Um, but it could be that you had like a toxic exposure that was the big trigger for the main autoimmune thing and then the leaky gut kind of came after, but most of the time it's involved in some way. So I just wanted to point like those main factors out because what you're covering is so important. Um, any other thoughts that you have yeah, on those? I mentioned the blood sugar and the blood sugar is one of the ones so when I talk about the fundamentals of autoimmune which is a course that I'm creating right now um blood sugar is one of the biggest ones we have to have that blood sugar in the balance otherwise we are creating more oxidative damage we are creating it and a lot of the time um when we're, we're talking about that the molecular mimicry it's things that are binding onto these organs that don't look like they should and so the body's like well who are you because it's been damaged so absolutely right. Like those are really key points that there are little things that we can make big differences in that don't cost a lot of money. So controlling blood sugar, getting the sleep, eating a lot of antioxidants are really, really important um, for controlling a lot of the side effects of autoimmune. Yep. And someone asked a question. They said, what about fatigue from myalgic encephalomyelitis? Is that the same as autoimmune fatigue? It's all the same. So when we look at the different conditions, essentially what they're saying is the area that's being damaged. It's all the same um, mechanism underlying. It's the immune system, right? It's all that, it all tears down. So thyroid, um, Hashimoto's grades, it's the thyroid that's being attacked, but it's the immune system. MS, immune system's attacking the nervous system. RA, it's the joint. So it's just, those just describe kind of where it's being attacked. Um, and, it, but it's all the same mechanism. And I kind of describe it in the same way, right? Where again, it's like, how far down the progression are you? Because basically it's all inflammation that has yeah. gone awry down the wrong biochemical pathway and activated a part of the immune system that's not supposed to be as active. It's an entire spectrum. So you can be yeah. at any range along that spectrum. And the idea of autoimmune remission is like, maybe you made it past a certain benchmark on that spectrum. You got diagnosed with a condition because your markers are not high enough, but then you start changing all your lifestyle habits and doing all the stuff that we're talking about and all of a sudden those markers start to go down and then you kind of go back down that spectrum and our immune system essentially has a lifelong memory so once we have a reaction to something we are going to have a lifelong sensitivity to that thing more so than somebody else who maybe hasn't been through the same experience it doesn't mean that you can't down regulate it to the point where your body kind of forgets about it and it's happening at such a subclinical level that it's no longer a really presentable problem but that is the idea that like once you have autoimmune it's pretty hard to like not have it but you can go into full remission where it's not active in your system and then you know there's lots of cool stuff coming out and we're still researching on things like epigenetic changes that come from things yeah. like hyperbaric oxygen therapy and all these other cool modalities that are out there so just know that you know we're still coming to understand it and oh, learn it and so new. i also just want to add Add, and I'm sure you have your thoughts on this too. The other thing that I think is the most important in autoimmune is getting your mindset right. Yes. Because it's all about the signals that are coming from your brain telling your immune system what to do. And if the signals from your brain are super defensive and inflammatory, your immune system is going to be super defensive and inflammatory. So that is another we'll call it a treatment modality that's just as important, if not as important or more important than some of the other ones that we're talking about. 100%. And if you have any thoughts on that, please feel free to share. No, I think, and that's where a lot of the research is showing as well is like, so we know that there's a connection, like the vagus nerve is your brain to your gut, your gut to the brain. So we know that these things are changing when we get anxious, when we get nervous. And it's more of what, so our thoughts are huge and it's the emotion that comes with the thoughts that for a lot of people are triggering things. So we, like there was a really, a really cool study done on um, rats because we can't ethically do it on humans. And what they did is they stressed out these rats and they found that it actually, from a brain perspective, changed the inflammation in the gut, changed how the gut presented so it was more leaky, so hyperpermeable, and it changed the flora of the gut. So exactly how you're talking, like our thoughts. So if you're walking around and being like, oh, this sucks oh, I've got a bum knee or whatever it is. It's the emotions that also go with it and how it's impacting the nervous system. Um, so it's all, it's all connected. It's all connected. 
Absolutely. And then ooh, we have two interesting questions. So someone was mentioning that they're dealing with fibromyalgia and then they have like a bunch of brain fog and it's really hard to focus. And like, how do you do these exercises with that? We're about to dive into a whole bunch of nutrition stuff. And that would be a really good place to start. If you're having a hard time starting with the mind, start with the body first. Yeah. And then someone else also asked a question. <clears throat> do you think autoimmune can be brought on by a possible, um, there's certain terminology that we are harder to use on Instagram, but basically by like an injury of an injection of some kind. And yeah, it's um, all inflammation. Yeah, it's all inflammation. Whatever will trigger inflammation. So a lot of the time when we're looking at a genetic predis predisposition for autoimmune, it's that under any kind of stress, so physical, mental, emotional, whatever chemical stress on the body, your your genetic pattern is to spike inflammation like just go through the roof of inflammation for someone who doesn't have autoimmune their inflammation may not spike that high and then it's getting it back under control because inflammation and immune response go hand in hand they go hand in hand they feed into each other yes. and when you have more debris from inflammation now the body's like oh what is that stuff there we should go clean that up too so it's yeah absolutely there's it's um it's all connected and it's usually about like the pattern of things happening right so like a common thing that i'll see is someone will um, have a doctor's appointment scheduled for you know an injection that they need to get or something and not to say that they don't have their place appropriately but it's all about timing with your body and like what's going on and so sometimes people will have a cold before that and they'll be sick and they'll have a fever and then they'll take tylenol and then they'll go and they'll get an injectable and then all of a sudden the tylenol has prevented their glutathione from working properly and their body can no longer protect them and their cells appropriately from that extra chemical stressor so it's kind of that recipe depending on what's going on and then let's say that you kind of do the same situation but you're already sick and you're super emotionally stressed out you don't have the capacity to handle a chemical stressor so if you are planning on doing something like that it's important to prime your body appropriately so that you have the resources and it can focus on that thing instead of focusing on also a physical ailment and also a mental stressor and also a chemical thing so just like a, a easy way to think of it but let's dive into food which i think is one of the most confusing and awesome things that we can use for this stuff that is something that you can do at home for free already <clears throat> and i know that we're about to cover kind of the idea of restrictive diets in a way that might be um, a little contrarian because a lot of people think that you have to be on like a super restrictive diet to heal your autoimmune which yes sometimes to a point depending on what your body's doing and then we also have to make sure that you don't end up nutritionally deficient. And I know you've done a whole series on this, yeah. so I'd love to hear your thoughts. So I actually used to be, I, I was an AIP autoimmune paleo certified coach. Um, I did the certification and did it for quite a few years and quickly realized within a couple of years that, oh my goodness, I, am I, I'm causing more damage than good. And when we start to look at the research, one of the things about going on a restrictive diet is with autoimmune, we know it's it as long like with leaky gut one of the things that we really do know is that our microbial our gut flora in our our stomach is narrow so we have a lower diversity of different bugs all that kind of stuff and we start doing stool tests a lot of times you'll see it in the good bacteria it's just lower amounts and then a narrow diversity when we go on a restrictive diet what we've done is just even narrow that further and we know from research, when we start to remove the microbiome from animals, they get very sick. So we're now this big experiment of what's happening. Um, when, what's happening when we start to restrict. And what I always say is restrictive diet is, so if you feel better on it, any of the diets that are pulling out major food groups, what you've just said is that I have a digestion problem. So it's not the foods, it's how you're breaking the foods down. Either you're not breaking them down and they're large proteins, some are harder to break down. So we just need to enhance the digestion a little bit better, or you've got about an imbalance of microflora. So we've got it more, uh, and it may just be some of the good bacteria is just overgrown. It's usually not a pathogenic one, although sometimes it can be. So when we start to look at that. Those are the two reasons why people feel better in a restrictive diet. Now, what we know, this came out around 2019. Um, there was some research that came out and said that when we restrict our foods and that bacteria we feel better so that bacteria goes dormant oh, i always call it the stray cat so when you actually put that food back in it's like the stray cat you feed it it comes back when you stop feeding it it goes away but as soon as you put that food back in that cat's right back there so the bacteria has the same behavior and that's what we're starting to see and we are just like 
we're talking about tipping the iceberg on autoimmune. Autoimmune, we are just like last five years, we learned so much about the immune system. It's coming out day and day. The same with the microbiome. We are just, we are just getting to know exactly the behaviors of it. And that's essentially what's influencing a lot of the inflammation is the change in our flora. So if you have to remove those big food groups, really take a check and be like, okay, well, why? Why do I have to? And when I put it back in, what reactions do I get? And it's most likely a digestive issue. 99% of the time, it's a digestive issue. Now there's celiac and other things like that, like lactose intolerance, um, where you just, you don't do well with the enzyme. You're not producing the enzymes. You can't drink milk, you get a digestive. Um, but most of the time, it's just you can't break the foods down. And so we have to address the gut, not restrict them. I love that. And that goes into not only addressing flora, but also things like our gut lining and our stomach lining so we can actually produce our stomach acid correctly so that we can digest our food and prevent things like SIBO and buildup of toxins in the gut and all of that. So I love that perspective. And I'm curious, just what are some of, I guess, like what are some of the most common things that you will find with some of the autoimmune cases that you work with of things that you know would be kind of the primary things that the body may not agree with versus when it's like someone really needs digestive enzymes or even checking for you know because it's like if there's one autoimmune there's probably another one so it's like sometimes i go and i look for antiparietal cell antibodies which are is basically your immune system accidentally attacking the cells that produce your stomach acid so if you're also getting reflux and you're getting bloating and you're getting SIBO like symptoms it may be that there's something like that going on and then you can't absorb your b12 as well which means that you can't process your detox pathways or your neurotransmitters or repair your cells so they all ties in together it's like none of this is separate but what are some of the most common things that you see with clients where you're like eh, this might make sense for you to cut out versus like no i actually think that we need to give you like digestive enzymes or really work with the lining first well and that's where it becomes really individual but here's one of the things that we can definitely take away so we can do a very short period six to eight weeks of elimination diet so you can remove those foods for six to eight weeks the most valuable information is when you put them back in what do you experience so are you noticing that when you remove massive groups, when you remove just slightly things, corn, for example, none of us digest corn. Um, you may be like ruling out celiac is one of the top ones that I do, especially if we're talking Hashimoto's, um, but you may be non-celiac gluten sensitive. So we want to take a look at why. So when you're pulling those foods out, we always want to get back to a, a diverse diet. So we want to have a lot of that. But if you have to pull out the whole carb group, so you can't have any grains, um, night shades as well. Like we want to get those back in, get the digestion flowing because there's a lot of nutrients in these things. Some of the other things that we take a look at to see how absorption is, is how well are you absorbing iron, B12? Like what does your blood work look like? So if you're not absorbing those, then we can, we can kind of, depending on some of the other factors as well, like do you have a lot of gas and bloating? Are you burping? Um, is it really foul smelling? Are you having formed stools? Like all of that can tell us a lot about what's going on in the gut, where you're experiencing a lot of the gas, is it more of a chest pressure and you feel better when you burp? Well, then we're talking stomach. If it's more flatulence, then we're talking possibly large intestine, which is where most of the bacteria should be. It's large intestine and then our stomach, um, not the small intestine. So we can, we can find out a lot. And sometimes I'll have people trial a digestive enzyme. So if you feel better, what a digestive enzyme does is it pre-digests the food so that you're not fermenting it as much. So you should have less gas and bloating with that. We can play around with stomach acid, ox bile, if you don't have a gallbladder. Like these are all things that we want to consider. So that's, it is a little bit more of an individualized. I wouldn't throw all of that at one person, but when they're just things that we want to consider kind of a checklist. Yep. And you know, like I run food sensitivity tests in my practice and there's arguments against those because they're like, oh, like they change over time and it's not that accurate. I'm like, well, yeah, it does change over time. But to me, I also really like actionable items. And it's like, these are the foods that your immune system is reacting to right now. And if we're trying to calm down your immune system, then let's just like take a break on these. And we can bring them back later. But people might be wondering, they're like, okay, well, like my joints just hurt and like, I don't have any bloating, but like, I definitely have autoimmune. Like, why are we talking about the gut? So let's go into leaky gut a little bit and foods that we can do for helping that and why it's tied to all this autoimmune stuff. Right. So leaky gut, so our guts are naturally leaky. We, we all have leaky gut. So it's like, it's, but with autoimmune, what we're seeing is there's more inflammation, more damage. 
you're not breaking your foods down, you could have a bacterial imbalance. In fact, the number one cause of leaky gut is bacterial imbalance. Uh, also, stress response. So then what we're having happen is the, the tight junctions are pulling away and that bigger food particles can get through. So if you're having all of these things happen, you're probably not digesting and then you are gonna have more food sensitivities because now your gut's hyper permeable. So for a lot of the times, we wanna just really kind of reduce inflammation. One of the best, um, best dietary approaches, which I'm starting to flip to more, is making sure that we're getting our fiber to feed our microbiome. Now, if you're someone who can't tolerate fiber, once again, we have to ask about why. Why can't you tolerate it, especially for trying different fibers? So maybe one you are a little more sensitive to, but what about the other ones? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're getting our fiber to really feed our gut. There's a lot of nutraceuticals that we can use to kind of calm the inflammation in our gut. Um, but when we're looking from a food perspective, I find the Mediterranean diet by far, hands down, one of the best that has one of the most research and two, it's one of the ones that's most sustainable. So a lot of times we'll do elimination diet and then transition. That's our goal is to get to the Mediterranean diet. So lots of fruits and vegetables, legumes are not our enemies. Um, we wanna make sure that we're digesting them. So we may have to do some digestive work first to get to that point. But when we start to look at that, like we're getting our omega-3s. Um, one of the things about a lot of restricted diets is we're getting a lot of saturated fats. That, when we have autoimmune, the big problem with that is that when we look at that, we are at a higher risk of comorbidities for cardiovascular already, just because we have inflammation. So we wanna make sure um, that we're just addressing all of these different things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I had someone also, they asked a question, I'm figuring out like how to integrate these into our conversation well, but someone asked, like, how can someone combat prednisone issues with weight gain and war in the gut? So we're talking about a lot of inflammatory pathways. If someone has recommended prednisone, it's probably because you are dealing with a hyperactive immune system. Now, all the stuff that we're talking about is still relevant because it's lowering the inflammation naturally and learning how to listen to the body and listen to its responses, which is exactly what she was talking about with like a elimination diet and then re-entry. And on the food sensitivity test I run, like the most common things I see are grains, dairy, eggs, corn, soy, and sugar, like for the most part. And a lot of people forget about eggs and I like eggs, I think they're great. They have awesome nutrients, but there might be a time in your life where you have to limit them for a little while. I had to do that for like two years when my body was cleaning a chemical exposure and I can have them now, I just don't have them all the time. And so it's learning how to listen to your body in that way. And the other tricky part about steroids is that yes, they prevent your immune system from working. So it's not hyperactive, but they also prevent your immune system from working, which means that it prevents it from repairing. And so if you're dealing with gut issues and you're dealing with that medication, it can be even more important for you to do this stuff because your immune system is slower to repair. So it means that you have to take more care in not providing irritating, damaging things to the gut. And you may think that you tolerate foods well because you don't get bloating or you don't get this or you don't get that, but then you wonder why you have headaches and joint pain and brain fog and lethargy. And that may be the way that you're not tolerating that food. So it doesn't always show up as a digestive thing. It can show up as depression and anxiety and skin issues and brain fog stuff and all of that. And then the other thing to someone asked, like my blood work always looks great and I struggle so much with fatigue and lethargy. Um, oftentimes like the thyroid can look fine, but it can be the mitochondria, which is a little bit tougher to check on a traditional blood panel. And sometimes doing something like an organic acid test can be helpful. So Dr. Danby, in all of this, like when you're having someone who might be dealing with like um, a steroid that is helping them in the right way, but they're looking to do things more naturally and they're working with the gut, but maybe also dealing with this lethargy. Like, how do you tie in mitochondrial health to the leaky gut along with all the stress that we've talked about, those types of things? So, well, so that, that's a really loaded question. Yes, it <laughs> is. Feel free to, I left it open ended, yeah, but okay. I knew that you probably have an interesting so, thought. Um, when we're looking at that, so a lot of the times, what, I, what the way I then approach autoimmune is a lot of people do come in on steroids with me, and it, because it's just it, they, we just need something to calm it down. So I always say I kind of do a two prong approach. So one is we're working with the body to help bring it down, so that they can taper off the steroids, and that we can then use something, hopefully, um, something that will hold it. Or we've now identified some of the main areas, the root causes that could be triggering that immune response. 
Um, and that could be many different things. So depending, we have a lot of natural supplements. I will say though, in the research, nothing replaced the medication. So there's nothing like uh, curcumin does not have the same benefits um, as so especially with RA, people are like, well, I just want to do, do it naturally. And, and I totally understand that, but we need to make sure that we're not causing more damage because once that damage is caused in the joints, it's really hard to go back. So just the heads up on that. But there's a lot that we can do to help reduce it and help the body settle down, get you sleeping better and all those different things. So when we look at some of the anti-inflammatories, so cucumarin, uh, quercetin, depending on how your immune system is playing out, I always look at it as a teeter-totter. Um, we want it to be flexible, but a lot of times it gets stuck up there. There's a lot of things that we can do to help the gut. Um, like Dr. Christine said about the foods, we can pull certain foods out for the time being and then hopefully get them back in and figure out why we can't. Eggs is a big one. It's one of the biggest ones that I see as well. Um, <laughs> if we think about what the function of eggs are in the real world, especially the egg whites, they're protective. So they're going to they're gonna kind of seek and destroy. Um, so when we kind of look at the mitochondria, one is we want to see, is there anything that's, it's the reason why it's yelling danger, danger. So we really want to see if we can identify that. We want to see like mold exposure is a really big one for that. That's one of the ones that was what impacted me the most, uh, was mold exposure. So I became a, you too. Yeah, I became a certified mold practitioner for that reason. Um, so we want to start to look at what are the different reasons why the mitochondria might be off. And then just really giving it nutrients. The antioxidants are some of the top things that we give, and there's a lot of evidence for them in um, autoimmune. So NAC is one, CoQ10 is some of the other ones, um, alpha lipoic acid. Now they take a longer time to really help. So that's why we don't really delay the steroids. We wanna get everything settled down, and then we wanna kind of feed and nurture the body. And that's one of the reasons why I've really pivoted away from the restrictive diets, is because we wanna nurture the body. We want to up to bring it up and give it enough nutrients and support and all of those macros of protein, fats, and carbohydrates that are all healthy to just really support that body. So there's a lot of nutritional stuff that we can do. Um, one thing about the fatigue, I wanna, if, are you okay if I kind of pivot a little bit? Okay. okay. Yeah. So fatigue has come up quite a few times and my most favorite study in the entire world, and if anyone's ever listened to my podcast, you'll hear me talk about this study often, there was a study done on rheumatoid arthritis. People with active um, rheumatoid arthritis, they're all women, they were put into four categories. One was uh, dynamic exercise, so it was just a little bit of cardio and weightlifting. Um, and then they played a community sport once a week. The other was Mediterranean diet. They had a combo group and then they had the control group. And what they found in this study is that the diet group alone did not actually achieve the biggest outcomes. The best one for um, overall fatigue was the exercise group, not the combo. Everyone thinks it's the combo. It was the exercise group. So even though we are in pain and we're exhausted, moving your body actually had the best outcomes for mental health and for fatigue. And then disease control was the exercise group and the combo group. So when we start to look at that, there's so much that you can do. And the other interesting thing about the study, and this is what I call the, um, uh, the power of doing nothing. So what they found is in the control group, everything just got worse. Even though they were all medicated, they still continued to get worse through the 12 weeks that, or sorry, it was 24 week study. Um, so that just shows us just moving our body, getting it the proper foods. Um, you can make a big difference in 24 weeks. You probably see a difference a lot earlier. I see that with my patients. Um, when we start doing just the fundamentals, and then we go into that advanced stuff because the mitochondria, we look at what exercise does for the mitochondria, it's huge. It's like we're now making mitochondria resilient. We're building new ones. So it's, uh, it's really powerful. Well, and mitochondria are such an interesting thing. So for anyone who like doesn't remember from high school, right? Because that's the thing they're talking about, the thing that does the Krebs cycle that everyone yeah. thought was pointless. Powerhouse. No, it's basically how you produce your life force. Um, it's really important. It's the engine of your cell. It's like a little battery of your cell. And if they're not, they can get leaky too, right? We can have leaky mitochondria just like we can have leaky gut and leaky brain. And they work on a gradient, kind of like water pressure. And so if they get leaky, they don't work as well. And we can't produce our energy as well. And if you're like taking thyroid medication, it's just not landing. It might be that the factory that the thyroid medication is supposed to help affect is broken. And so it's like, we need to work on the factory there. And stress is a huge component of this. 
if not equal or secondary to the chemical toxin exposure. So I know that you've done even like a whole series around stress and how this relates to everything that we've discussed. And I always like to describe it to people as like, allostatic load, right? Our body has a certain amount of capacity for what it can handle. And if you have a bunch of stress going on, you're not going to have a physical or a toxin capacity. If you have a toxin going on, you're not going to have emotional resilience and you're not going to have physical capacity and you're likely to get injured. If you have an injury going on, you're not going to have emotional resilience and you're not going to handle toxins well. So if we can look at it that way, then we can start to understand how to actually balance our body in a sustainable way. And I think in today's world, stress is one of the biggest weights on that allostatic load because of everything that we've normalized, like driving on the highway and having to pay a bunch of bills and having 3,000 emails to respond to, like that all weighs at the back of our mind on our neurological stress system. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this affects autoimmune, kind of like we talked about at the beginning and even how it affects mitochondrial health too. Yeah, so the number one, um, I just posted this on Instagram a few weeks ago, the number one cause of lupus diagnosis is overwhelm, which is stress. Um, number two is actually halogen lights, which is stress. So I know I was shocked by that. That was by the CDC. CDC. So when we start to look at it, um, stress is essentially not just kind of the stress at low, like a lot of, I always find when I ask people, so what's the stress in your life? And they just roll their eyes. And we talk about stress because a lot of times it's just been like, oh, it's too much stress. But when you really define, like I love how you just define stress because stress is, I always call it the Jenga. So we can handle so much until we then fall over. And it's more of a busy, busy, go, go. Like the traffic you said, you know, driving, uh, one of my patients actually called herself a limo driver for her kids as opposed to a taxi, although the tips are terrible. Um, but it's all those little things of, it just piles up. You're not taking time for yourself. You're not tabbing that downtime. A lot of people want to stay up late because it's the only time they have to themselves, which then now you're putting yourself into a shift work scenario where you're not getting enough sleep, we know that less than seven hours of sleep for autoimmune actually progresses your disease. And that was done on animal studies and they found it in humans, lupus, Hashimoto's, quite a few of the different ones. So if you're not getting your sleep, you're now in shift work, which is all cause mortality increase. If you're staying up too late, all that kind of stuff. Um, work a lot of times, especially with COVID, having the kids at home and now going back from all this, like it's just, it's been crazy. I often say, if we look at how our grandparents lived, so my grandfather um, died at 92, and he, the first half of his life was organic food. It, the, they, they didn't have indoor plumbing. They didn't have electricity. Our bodies have not evolved. We do not have time to evolve to what we have today. So we have so much information coming at us. And we just have overload all the time. So really taking that time to unplug taking that time to step away from electronics, going out to nature. That is why nature walks will reduce your stress load. One hour will reduce your stress load for an entire week. So it's crazy when we start to look at that. Walking through the city increases your stress load. So yeah, I think that was really important how you define stress. Well, and I think of it as bits of information too, right? And it's like, that's where, I mean, not only like with our emails and stuff where we, oh, I have to respond like that stress, but also the idea of like, there's so many bits of information. Every single piece of information your computer is processing, your brain is processing too. Because I think about like the file systems I have set up in my computer that exist in the cyberspace that also exist in my head. And my head keeps track of all those different file maps, not only on my computer, but on somebody else's Google Drive and all of that, in addition to driving 60 miles an hour on the highway and a hundred cars coming at me. And like, we just normalize all this, right? Like it's, it's something that we just do every day. So having a little bit more grace with your body when you're like, why am I so stressed out? It's like, well, you just drove 60 miles on 60 miles an hour on the highway on your way home. Like take a minute to breathe in your driveway before you yeah. go inside to your family. And so letting so yourself understand your body in this way, I think makes a huge, huge difference. Um, any other tips that you really like to give your clients around stress and stress management as one of the most important components of their autoimmune remission care? Yeah. So one of the things that I, one of the things that I love, um, and it, it does not take a lot of time is it only takes three breaths to come out of the stress response. It only takes three. So you can be sitting there. Every one of us could be doing it right now. Three deep breaths. That is it. So before you eat, I love the, like how many people just feel so good when they get home and they sit in their car for a few minutes. Like those three deep breaths are so powerful. So doing it often throughout the day, a lot of times I'll say 10 deep breaths, which is less than two minutes of deep breathing. 
set your alarm. I have teachers, their alarm goes off in the middle of the class and the whole class does the deep breathing. So at least it brings you down. Whether you go back up or not right after, that's fine. You're training your brain to be able to come down. And that is a skill that we need to learn. A lot of people are like, oh, I, I, I just can't meditate. I, I just can't. That's a skill. We have to learn how to bring our brains down. Not something I'm good at, but it's something I practice. Well, I, I tell people it's the gym for your brain, right? Yeah. And it's the, if you're like, I just can't meditate, it's the equivalent of like, I just can't lift this box, so I'm going to leave it on the floor for the rest of my life. It's like, well, at some point, you're going to have to figure out how to lift the box. I love that. Yeah, that's yep. exactly it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. This has been awesome. I could talk to you about this stuff all day, but if I know some people were like curious about like, can I get this in written format? And I had written like ask Dr. Danby about some of her programs. Like if people wanted to learn more about this or review this information or work with you or talk to you, where would you send them? Yeah. So you can reach out to me on Instagram at Dr. Uh, Allison Danby. Um, and, or you can even visit my website, allisondamby.com. It's one L A L I S O N D A M B Y.com. Uh, and yeah, or just even send me a DM and I can send you whatever that you're looking for. We, we've got tons of resources. I've got lots of master classes. Uh, the Autonomy Fatigue one right now is a course that's on sale. So yeah, reach out and we can, I can send you all the stuff that I've done. I love teaching. Teach, I used to be a high school math teacher. So teaching for me is my passion and the 17 years I realized that, uh, I, as much as I love teaching, I like to teach health. I love teaching health. So yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy about you too, is like, I think we share that passion for teaching people how their bodies work to empower you to really become your own health advocate, because that really is the only sustainable model for health. This whole model we have set up of like victimhood and you have to be fixed from the outside. It's just like not empowering or healthy for anyone. So we really want to change the model of teaching you guys how to take care of yourselves. So yeah. yeah, please reach out to her if you have any questions. Uh, same, just send me a message if you have any questions. Please comment below when this gets posted and ask a few further questions. We can always do a second round of this and kind of yeah. answer some more advanced questions and share it with anyone you think is useful. And that's why we do this. So thank you so much for taking the time today and any last thoughts at all? Well, thank you for being here. I love, yeah, this has just been so much fun and just getting this knowledge out. There is one of the biggest things I do think is there is a way that we can do healthcare that combines everything. So yes. it's not just the medication, it's all the other things that make the biggest impact. So that's where, this is what I love doing. And just, I really do, I agree with you. I think that we need to be the CEOs of our health. I'm up in healthcare in Canada. And even though we have a tax-based system, I was going to say free, um, there's a lot of downfalls to that. We're still getting late diagnosis. We're still getting dismissed really quickly. There's still a lot of frustrations. And so autoimmune is a frustrating condition to begin with. Um, if we can make that journey less frustrating, that's our goal. And that there is so much that you can do. Yeah. There's so much. So, yeah, we're exciting. all about the integration of care, but approaching it from the mindset of empowering you to understand everything that's going on and how you can affect it with natural things in your life. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. I'll look forward to next time. Yeah, take care. Thank you, everyone.